Welcome everyone in another episode of Researcher Celebrity powered by Empowering Science Foundation. Today, we have Dr. Aritri Datta with us. A brief about Dr. Aritri. She has done her bachelor's in zoology from Presidency College, Kolkata. Master's, she pursued biophysics and molecular biology in University of Calcutta. And then for PhD, immunology and infectious disease is the area which she pursued at West Bengal State University, Kolkata. For postdoc, she went to CCMB Hyderabad and studied hypoxia and cholesterol metabolism. And presently, she is grant advisor at DBT Welcome India Trust, India. And with this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Dr. Aritri at the platform. Dr. Aritri, thank oh. you. Thank you, Dr. Kushwa. Uh, thank you for having me on this wonderful initiative that you have launched. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm very glad to be a part of this um, today. Yes. So we have the set question for all of our researcher celebrities that how and when you decided to become a researcher? Well, so uh, to answer this question, I will go back way back in my high school. Uh, so I know uh, mostly it is probably preposterous to tell you that I knew I would be a researcher when I was in class 10, but uh, something I uh, did. Uh, so I had a, a, a cousin sister. She was already into research and a chance conversation with her around my class 10 board uh, actually made me feel that, okay, uh, I, I really would like to be a part of this. So I think uh, while I was giving my boards, I pretty much knew that, okay, I am going to work on the research field uh, at that time. Uh, so that is uh, when I decided that I would do this, um, provided, uh, as you know, the schools used to give you, whether you're getting science or getting commerce or getting arts, and my parents said, if the school gives you science, you're going to go into science, <laughs> or else what, whatever you have. And I got it, uh, and I realized that I have a special place for biology, and uh, the uh, not that I was, I was, I was pretty good in maths, a uh, little lousy in physics though. Uh, but I, I thought that uh, th this is fine. I, I would go ahead and do this. Uh, but typical uh, to my times, I mean, I was in the early 2000s. It was very difficult that if you're get, getting science, you're either going to be an engineer or going to get into the medical uh, profession. Uh, so, yes, I, I did those rounds. I, I did appear for my medical entrance tests and everything. But deep down inside, I probably have already knew that I'm going to really work towards some place where I can get into research and uh, once all these rounds were over my results were out I uh, went and took a mission in BSc Zoology in Residence College which was one of the most top-notch colleges at the time for zoology so yes that is how I entered uh, my domain um, I went on to become uh, went on to go and do my bio uh, masters in biophysics and molecular biology because I wanted to do a little specialization and uh, it just seemed to be a very fancy subject to do at that time and uh, I, I realized that I I should have been a little good in my physics at that time but I kind of brushed it up in those two years uh, then uh, I kind of took a pause because uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to come to CCMB and do a project for two three months. And um, so the research life, I, I got a taste of the research life then. Uh, I published during my master's thesis. And uh, I, I really wanted to take a break and understand that if it is really truly for me or not. Because thinking and being into that uh, conundrum was very different. So I, uh, I, for two years, I was teaching in a college as a guest lecturer. And I did uh, a little bit of content uh, development for a, a biological edu uh, education venture which was uh, very nascent at that stage because I don't think so much content development was happening but I enjoyed those both the work however in 20 uh, later on uh, two years later I realized that I would uh, really start getting back into research I did very small projects back in my BSc college in presidency they were basically, basically ecological project and from there on I got in touch with my PhD supervisor who was beginning a lab, was looking for uh, new uh, motivated young students. Uh, and uh, I just thought that, and he was, he had a lot of unique ideas and I thought I would like to work with, with a perspective of immunology in infectious biology. And so I joined him at that time. So here, here this is how my journey into research came in. And uh, I, I did my 
PhD from there. It was a new lab, a lot of challenges, but I did it. And then I moved on to do my postdoc. So yeah, that has been the summary of my getting into research. Great. So a 10th standard student thinking yeah. to become a researcher, then publications in master's and even at bachelor's, you did ecological uh, projects where you met your advisor for PhD. So you did starting from thinking to become a researcher, went to teaching, tasted and then did their content development. Now you, when you were affirmative of that, you really want to pursue for PhD, you met your advisor. And now let's start with the journey of uh, PhD. How would that went? So uh, that was pretty challenging because uh, I was, uh, as I said, my supervisor was very young and had unique ideas and I was sold to all his ideas. So, uh, so what is, I, I, so I, I joined him, but when we went to the lab, it was in the university. He has just set it up. We uh, essentially being an immunological lab is about wet lab work. And wet lab is like, it begins with cell culture and everything. So we did not even have a cell culture at that time. Uh, so uh, I had a senior also who was working in a collaborative project for the supervisor in another lab. So he had some know-how and my supervisor was a hands-on supervisor at that time. And most of the techniques I learned from him were hands-on. And uh, it was very fortunate. I, I think at that time, sometimes I used to have doubts, but it was really fortunate that I got the chance to actually develop a cell culture from scratch for a lab. I mean, uh, getting cells, we, we started with secondary cell lines and these secondary cell lines used to get from other people and try and get them established in the lab, uh, try to get all those correct formulation of the media because it's it's just like when you take it from another lab, they say, okay, use these, 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 these constituents and you would, uh, it'll be fine. But when you used to do the same thing with us, we never used to uh, get the results, the cells used to die. So just to try and try and get there was something that uh, was frustrating, nevertheless, but was really challenging. And I think that really helped me uh, to take on challenges more. And uh, so, as I said, it was immunology uh, based lab and my research um, and my research was based on developing therapeutics for Leishmaniasis or Kalazar. Uh, now, uh, if you if if you go by the statistics today, uh, I mean I'm talking about ten years ago when I uh, entered PhD. I mean go by the statistics today, Kalazar is more or less eradicated in India. Still has prevalence in Bihar, uh, some parts of Orissa. West Bengal is more or less clear out of this, but at that time uh, there was a lot of patients coming, not from the urban sector but from the rural sector, most towards the mm, I would say uh, Sundarban area. Uh, because there's an estuarine and the flies that carry this, there was a lot of uh, ecological habitat for them. So it was prevalent there. Uh, now, uh, the some 70 years ago, Dr. Yuen Brahmachari found a stibobutamid, which could be used against Lishmania because India at one point, being a tropical country, was ravaged with Lishmania. Uh, even urban people were affected at that time. But... Uh, then that started, as it happens with any medicine over so much broad spectrum of years, at it starts that it starts to become resistance to some of the strains that are now infecting people. So then WHO got a smiltifosin, which was very effective, very cheap oral formulation of a drug. But the problem here was that you have to take a 21 day course. And I'm talking about a population that are probably daily wage laborers. So they used to come, take their medicine and go and have that medicine so for them once the fever is gone they think they are fine and so there is how pockets of resistance started happening for miltifosin as well now in now the idea was there was a, another drug available amphotericin b but that is a liposomal based drug and that is quite costly so the idea was to develop something from a, a herbal source if we could develop and uh, th that was a very unique idea because no one has uh, tried this. And more so, my PI had an idea that uh, mushrooms, indigenous mushrooms are much uh, widely used in the Himalayan belts. And they are known to have uh, some uh, medicinal properties as well. So his big idea was that uh, if you can collaborate with a chemistry lab and you can get us isolated compounds from there, uh, then we, we may be able to develop some 
therapeutic against each value. So uh, that is where it started, uh, high risk, uh, high gain project. And uh, we went and we, we were glad that IIEST Shippur in uh, Kolkata, uh, the chemistry department, they collaborated with us. And uh, we used to, so we used to go on those treks in Himalaya. So it was also trek through the lab, we used to go and uh, get connected to the local dealers there, get edible mushrooms. Get them back to the to our uh, to Kolkata, where you know mushrooms will dry out very fast because, of course, the uh, there is so much of heat here. And then these people used to do their work, and finally we got a compound which was a carbohydrate complex. Uh, it was a, it was a polymer. It has a single uh, backbone which was uh, which was repeated, and it was a polymer. And uh, we and I was given the task to find out if this works out. And uh, incidentally, it did work out. But the fun part was uh, when we directly put it into Lichmania culture, it did not work out. Only if you are having uh, macrophages. Now, macrophages are basically those uh, cells which are the host for Lichmania. Now, when I used to culture macrophages, infect them, and then do this treatment, then we had a hundred, almost 50 to 60% clearance of the parasite. So this is where our work developed. And uh, we it, it was like with every step, we uh, we went to the next hypothesis. Okay, fine, this is doing this. Then maybe we'll shift it to the mice because uh, this should be much more privileged, uh, much more better observed in the mice. Then we went to the mice. And in each step, like uh, we went to mice, of course, we were then doing primary cell culture. And we need to establish primary cell culture before you could even get data for what we are trying to do. Then in the next step, uh, we, we we went on to do some cutting edge research using some cutting edge research technology. Like we had to use slow cytometry after a while for our immune cell population uh, distinction. And we did not have a flow cytometry at our institute, but we kind of collaborated with one that University of Calcutta had and used to go there. So it was a BD, a BD biosciences setup. And from there, uh, we kind of had data enough to apply for a grant to get a flow cytometry to our university. So uh, that, that has been a wholesome journey. I mean, right from starting cell culture, getting a flow cytometry, real-time PCR, just by your work, helping the department, your supervisor. Uh, so I, I find my PhD was very, very fulfilling. Apart from just research, I think it also helped a lot of character building for me as well. So now this brings us to a very important topic that when young researchers want to join a lab or a PI who's not yet established A and B is still in very initial phases of setting up the lab. So I have three questions here and you can uh, answer as you feel. So the first is establishing the lab from the scratch as a researcher, as a PhD student. Then second, developing the collaborations because you know outline of your project or your PhD that what you want, what you have, what you don't, and then collaboration comes in. And the third very important topic, which you just brought in here about developing a grant to get something which you don't have and is uh, very helpful for the Institute and for future generation of researchers in there. So, yes, please. Okay, so I'll go with the first one. Uh, it's always tricky to start working with a first time PI uh, and develop and, and almost be at par with the person in developing a lab. Uh, but it also comes with some perks. I mean, at least for my case, the biggest perk was since uh, he was very young, he was open to ideas. Uh, and it was more of an interaction because uh, sometimes we do see that uh, PG supervisors at a point when they're very established, uh, they're not much open to ideas. And because they're already have been successful in the way of their thought processes, uh, they believe this is the best thought process. But since my PI encouraged that, and I think uh, one of his biggest, uh, uh, I would say his, one of his biggest principles that I found that he had was that uh, there was a point that if you pointed out that he had uh, something that he has said during the discussion of a lab meeting, and that was not actually correct, because of course, there's such a vast literature on Lishmania that it kept on changing. It was very dynamic. It still is very dynamic. So, uh, because so many people are working on Lishmania. 
and then uh, you point that out two three days later that uh, okay this was that but i think this is what it is uh, you have to of course have evidence enough to back your claim we would immediately come and say yes you are right i am wrong and i think that encourages a, a atmosphere of trust once you have that it's more of an interactive pi and a pg scholar environment rather than just a hierarchical environment uh, we, you cannot escape hierarchy of course in indian system uh, but i think that was still something that really was encouraging and once you get such a motivation down put down on you responsibility is given to you you yourself stand up for the task i mean uh, i i was um, i won't say i was freshly out of masters but uh, it was i was still very young and then he, when this when the pi comes and tells you that okay i think you uh, do good cell culture it is your responsibility to establish all the protocols the sops that needs to be there in my lab for generations to come so that kind of responsibility when it comes to you it sometimes helps you in building up your own thought process and now you know that you would do a good job on this and when you are doing things on the scratch i think tomorrow if you want to establish a lab you exactly know what are the trouble shooting you have to do because uh, i'll say the university was also very young and uh, they used to have those big transformers for the electric line because the direct electric line was still not there for the university and there was one time there was heavy rain and the transformers just went kaput and the university was totally into like darkness for one and a half days entirely a minus 80 degree and my uh, was we did not have a minus 196 degree then but the minus 80 degree had stopped we had cell lines from over uh, my pi had gone to a conference and he had had established collaborations he got cell lines uh, from uh, abroad we lost all of those and we lost 10 cell lines but to again rebuild that and begin from where we left so that just gives you that motivation because you know he is also going to take responsibility for that and he's not going to blame you for anything else um, i think that what helps when you are working in a lab that is starting from scratch yet as i said it has its cons uh, if your pi is not open to suggestions uh, like my pi was open to suggestions even if i was suggesting for uh, let's say when you are going to purchase a co2 incubator i i could suggest in that uh, okay this is better than this so even these minor things are very necessary if you are willing to work for a young pi because a young pi needs to be also open to your ideas so uh, that is a question one a uh, question uh, to collaboration it was very difficult initially when you go from a very young pi's lab and uh, so we used to actually when before we started our flow cytometry experiments we needed to establish that whatever hypothesis we had was actually going to work uh, so uh, my pi sent us to his old lab uh, where he had done his phd in iicb kolkata and he uh, he said that i spoke to people there and you go and they will give you some antibodies and it was very costly of course so uh, when we went there we we had so me and my senior uh, we went there and we had this idea if we would get a we did not expect warm warm welcome but we would get what we came for but the kind of attitude that was put to us was very difficult and um, i think both of us were chanting in our head that okay we just need to get through this we just need to get through this we'll go back we'll get data and then we can buy our own set of antibodies but this is something that we need to get through this. and th those those days were difficult uh, but i think uh, one of the things that a uh, young pi and people who are or the first scholars who are working in the lab is they should target to get publications done i mean even if it's not like very high in publications you, you cannot wait for a very high in publication on your end like you cannot say say in immunology uh, if you see journal of immunology do there uh, it's it's kind of a holy grail you publish there if you're working with in immunology but uh, it's okay if you cannot publish there in the first one or two years you need to start publishing somewhere so people to take you seriously so i think this was something my pi knew me at all and uh, i think his lab established by 20 uh 10 and his first paper was out in 2011 so it was a very small paper uh though I, as i said he was also already working in a he his uh, grant was sanctioned but since the university did not have enough space so he had sent one of his students to a person he knew beforehand during his phd 
he was a very established scientist and some of the work was done there. Rest we did in our lab. And that got published in 2011. And that pace he kept on happening. In 2011, he published. 2012, he published uh, twice. And of course, he always uh, did acknowledge that since we were also working hard, it was easy. So once we started getting published, at least in Kolkata, we started getting recognized. Okay, fine, this is another lab that is coming up with a unique idea for Lishmanias' work. People started taking us seriously. And then uh, we went to conferences. The next thing we went to conferences, we started showcasing our work you know, by posters, oral presentations, uh, anything that worked. And we started developing collaboration. And through this, we went and collaborated with uh, these BD Biosciences who were nestled in University of Calcutta. And I think there was a point that they used to actually, uh, uh, for any demonstration, they used to have this call us and say, uh, do you have sample prepared? Can you just come in for us? And we will we will love to get demonstrated because they, there was this thing that started happening in University of Calcutta, though we were from a different university, that those people from that lab, they prepare amazing flow cytometry samples. So if you want to do good work, you can go and talk to them. So I think this is where your networking starts and this is where your collaboration happens. And we started on getting more collaboration. Uh, coming to the third question, writing a grant. So uh, what happened was when I joined my PI, he had a project and I joined there. Uh, but he was very insistent for me that, uh, so, uh, so there is there used to be this DST OSB uh, female scientist grant and that was for master students if they had some gaps after ma between masters and PhD. So since he was focused on taking more people, he said that why don't you apply for that and then you if you get the grant i can shift you to that grant and on the one fellowship that you are into i can take someone else so and he said i will help you out you you prepare a draft and we will we will work on that. and uh so i did in my first year phd i wrote a grant with his help and uh fortunately i i got i got to defend it and i got it. uh and my pi had because he was a new pi he also had a habit of writing he used to write grants, ICMR, DBT, DST. And I think as first as his first scholars, we sat there. We sat with him to develop this. Grants. We used to read literature and come and say, okay, fine, we can do this part of the thing. This is this is a lacuna we can fill up. We can use my share. We may not use my share. So uh, that is when we started writing grants for funding. Then came the time when we realized that uh, every time we used to prepare samples and and go to this place and get our acquisitions done on the flow cytometry. We used to lose, uh, I think we, our data was getting compromised. And then we realized that we needed to have a real-time PCR. We needed to have a flow cytometry. Now these are infrastructural grants, big grants. They are just given uh, to two people, two universities or an institute in one year. Now you have to convince the entire department that you needed this. Now the department has ecology people who would say that I don't need a flow cytometry. Uh, you can convince them on a real-time PCR, but not a flow cytometry. Mm -hmm. uh, cancer uh, biologists who are convinced, dead on convinced. But you have to also do a lot of internal management. You have to get people on board. And then, then uh, essentially, uh, we as scholars wrote a draft from each aspect of the work. Our data were like uh, polished almost at the level that we would be publishing it, but before publishing it, we just put it in the grant. And then we went ahead for, we actually the Department of, of Zoology in West Bengal State University got one infrastructural grant for themselves. They again collaborated with the Department of Botany to get another grant. So the university started building up on what we did the work on, and that is where it, it, it started building. But of course, as I come back to the point that you also need to have very enthusiastic PIs because uh, my PI was very enthusiastic. There was two, three more young PIs. They were very enthusiastic. As much as the scholars were helping them out, they were also thinking about the scholars that, okay, we have to get this for them. We have to get this for them if you're going to really make a mark. So that is how the journey went. So that's it. Now, so this is something very inspirational to all the young scholars who are either entering to PhD or just finished it because networking is very important. Either you are doing research in a small niche or a broader one, but networking is something which can increase the impact of your research, your outreach, as well as the acknowledgement when it comes that 
these days when even for grant writing what we have observed that it is always motivating motivating that if you can have multiple institutes in there and different PIs in different fields which uh, brings up an interdisciplinary grant and helps uh, for human health or if it is a other grant which is for ecology and other stuff so when you moved your focus from wet lab work to grant advising so now the challenge of a researcher in advising it although you had a great mentoring and brilliant track record of grant writing managing collaborating everything but what you can share with our researchers who are watching this video and are either thinking of it or are already facing problems in it. So, uh, when I, uh, it was a conscious decision to move to grants administration propelled by the pandemic at that time. Um, I was still in my postdoc and uh, most of the resources were getting directed to every everything that we could do for uh, combating the pandemic. Even I was a part of the uh, first call pandemic uh, uh, group. I used to go and get uh, testing done and everything. Uh, so there was a point when it really felt like that uh, th this is going to be difficult. It was in the late 2020s and I was working on a project on hypoxia and cholesterol metabolism my lab I was working on was high end uh, on cholesterol metabolism but hypoxia was something that we we're exploring for the first time and we really needed we, we already had collaborations in mind we were uh, talking to someone in Australia who was working on a concept of ox oxygen and cholesterol metabolism but we realized at a point that this collaboration to move forward was going to be very difficult and uh, there was a lot of emotional aspects also and uh, I had applied to this place, uh, DBT Welcome Trust India Alliance, uh, because they are unique in the way uh, where they recruit PhD postdocs for the grants advising roles. Uh, so uh, the interviews happened and uh, incidentally they offered me the job and I moved uh, into grants advising. I still remember there was a question in the interview when they asked almost something as similar as you asked me that how difficult it will be for you to shift from the wet lab to now that you've been in a more administrative uh, setup and why do you want to do this? So I remember telling them that uh, I, I, I don't think it will be difficult because as a PhD, you're already going to develop uh, all these qualities. You're going to be a team player. You are going to be someone with analytical and critical thinking abilities. Yeah, you are a problem solver because uh, you you... Every, it's not like any protocol that you're picking up from a paper is going to work for you. You have to troubleshoot yourself. So all these things are already there. That's the criteria that you're looking for in a grants administrator. Any PG student or postdoc will be managing a project. So those things are there. But what I what was I intrigued was that I had always been on this side of the table, receiving grants. I wanted to be on the other side of the table when you give grants. How do you do this? What are the things that you check when you are actually going to fund this project and not fund this project. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the time when I shifted. Uh, so the first thing that I had to do is de-learn a lot of things. I had to unlearn so many things, so many prejudices, like uh, prejudice of when you're looking at an application. So as a grants advisor, you know, the job there is that you look into a preliminary application where a person is sending you a 750 word uh, of his project, his own CV, his or her own CV, and, and where he, this person is going to work. So you think, you look into three P's. You look into the person, you look into the place, how, that how good this place would be for to, to sustain the project. And you're looking in the project mainly for the remedy of the project because India Alliance has a number of different grants. So they have a clinical grants. grants. They also have a biomedical grant. So you have to check that whether this falls into the remit. Now, if they are falling into the remit, how do you check if you're falling into the remit? So my uh, uh, manager told me that this is why we we have you. Because as a PhD, you would know exactly what you're looking into there. You are, you, you are into, you have been into this sector. You're looking at a person who is almost similar to your, you and you're looking into the project. So analyzing those projects, initially I, I was, so we don't take a call on this, but we definitely let it move to the next level. 
that whether this is something that would go to the next level. My scientific acumen was needed there. And how do you know it's going to the next level? Initially, it was difficult. I, I used to see a person and then I used to see, oh, this person has a cell, this person has a nature. But then my training was to understand that if this person has a cell and a nature, whether he's uh, the 11th author in the cell, or at least he has, let's say, one first author paper in a, in a decent journal. Because you know this person is, is on the track of independence. Because in big labs, in a, outside, you have multiple postdocs. And anyone is doing a little bit of that work and getting their name there. Yeah. So this was something that I had to learn first. Uh, not look into impact factors because I think more and more this thing is coming and that you cannot look into impact factors to see how much this article is getting cited. Maybe you look at a person's age index, still that should not be something as a criteria. So this was something that was difficult to learn. Once you learn it, uh, there's a one, one step that you have to do is when this project has gone through the full application, you are going to find out peer reviews. Now, this is where your scientific training comes into home. I had a project on AI and uh, optics and I had no idea from my training how these two comes together but I had to read that project I had to find the exact people who could review this well and so that I think helps in becoming as a grants advisor uh, but as I said it did help me in the interview because when they saw that I had managed a lab I had been instrumental in setting up a lab so if you have a chance if a young researcher has a chance to do something for the lab or something that is a little different from the regular PhD work, even if it's a organizing a conference, these things help if you're going to get into somewhere like grants advising or research management, because they're going to look into people who are organizers, who have that capability of uh, stakeholder management, if that is a term I can use, it's a little bit of corporate term, but you have to manage people at the end of the day, because when you're working in a team, you are going to have a lot of interpersonal relationships. You have to work with the people. In lab, you can still work in silos. You can you you, you can be not talking with half of the lab, but you can still do your work. But in, in a setup like this, you have to work with people. So that is how this thing happened. So here we got two questions for you. So the first one is, now you are helping researchers, either they are students or PIs, young or you know mature PIs, because there are different level of uh, grants which you are reviewing and helping with them. So what is the biggest uh, lacuna, if I will say, that you have seen in grants which comes to you and which you advise the researchers at different levels, either it's a PhD student or it's a mature PI who's about to retire and still asking for more funds. What are these things which you can suggest our researchers so that they can develop the grants in a uh, you know in a better way so that they can get funded without going a round of corrections uh, so i think the round of corrections that we are talking about should happen uh, before because so many times uh, when uh, i have seen preliminary applications that have a brilliant 750 words and you know you are sold and we we have internal meetings where you have to really uh, promote these things the cohort that you have you you feel for someone you're promoting that someone but i have seen that oftentimes that when this comes as a full application there's a lot of grantsmanship issue and by grantsmanship issue i'm not just telling that there are spelling mistakes or uh, punctuation problems or anything this is the diff there's a problem in the coherence of the project so uh, since we send it out to international PIs, then there is a selection committee that will look into this. They do see these things. They would say that um, this person is being too ambitious for the next five years. He's just trying to do a lot of fishing experiment and that is not going to work out. He should focus on something. The problem is, uh, I think uh, when we are, I, I, would, I would actually narrate an incident from my own uh, understanding. Uh, I applied for ICMR SRF project and I don't know, my PI was focused on the fact that we should give this, we should give that, we should give the, any, everything else. So the, the feedback that I received was that a project proposal was good, but it was very ambitious, too high for a three-year project. And I think this is where sometimes uh, our training in the academia is not so strong that we don't understand that putting in more doesn't mean that you're going to get that. Mm -hmm. Or having so many publications into into in, with so many people and just jam packing your uh, publication uh, say, uh, say 
part of the application is not going to get you that grant. What is going to get it is that you have to demonstrate, if you're a young researcher, you have to demonstrate your independence. That yes, you are ready to take 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 the flight. You're ready to take, take it to the next level. And for experienced researcher, it is more like what new are you doing? I mean, it's so easy to do whatever you're doing as an extension because you're, you're in the field for the last 10, 12 years. What are What is the next that you're trying to do? And I usually have seen grants getting turned down if the person is doing the same thing again with a different model system. So this this is some of the criteria. The one thing that I have realized that today grants, uh, this is this is a very important lesson. I, I, I think that all people in India and whoever they're, applying for grants really needs to understand is you have to get collaborators on your project because today you cannot do a particular part of the project and say okay i have done this and this is this this will have a translation effect. people are not asking you to at least india lines for basic biomedical science projects are not asking you to give you translation effects in the next five years what they're trying to ask that if you are doing let's say if you're doing a particular set of work where you're trying to identify any marker for a particular cancer you know you would need an, a person with a lot of a, maybe NGS uh, experience to do that project. But you are telling that I will do this. Yet your entire expertise does not show that you can do this. For a, I've seen for a selection committee, it's okay if you don't know this. But you have a collaborator who knows this. And you can collaborate with that person and get this done. So it's not like you have to know everything that you're putting in a grant. But you should have enough people to help you through this. And you should have mentors. And as you write a grant, I think one of the things that I've seen that this, uh, after the interviews, when we have some awardees and we have a number of declines, I've heard the selection committee people telling that uh, what they should do is write the grant, go back and show it to someone who is an expert in the field, show it to someone who's not an expert in the field, take the feedback, read the grant, and then submit the grant because these help. So I think these are some of the things that uh, anyone who is looking for funds should actually look at. Absolutely. And this is uh, what I would like to uh, say all the young researchers who are sub going to submit a grant, the three key points, if I can, uh, uh, and Dr. Aritri can correct me if I'm wrong, the three most important parts is your independence when you are submitting a grant. Keep your goals real realistic, okay? They should not be too optimistic, like too futuristic, which cannot be achieved in the certain limitation of that project and the third is the collaboration is the key so it increases these three points increases the chance of you getting grant and now when we are moving toward the edge of the conversation i would like to ask uh Arithri, do you miss your bench work research yes i do miss my bench work research uh mostly when i i am sitting in these interviews and uh someone is presenting something uh, which I have worked on, mm -hmm. and uh, sometimes I know. Oh, okay. Uh, this. Oh, this has this. Now this field is having this much of impact. Okay, I used to do that. So these are the time I do miss my research. And um, I, I, as I said, that uh, though I made a conscious move, it was a little uh, pushed pushed to the edge by COVID at that time. Uh, so there has been a certain. Uh, I would say. In certain ways, I had always thought that maybe I I, I will I I just wanted to wait out and maybe I will come back to research. So uh, I this this particular kind of uh, experience that what made me understand is if today tomorrow I'm going to apply a grant, I know what are the things I need to do <laughs> and how to get the selection committee. Uh, so yes, I miss my research at times, but at times it's it's also very uh, invigorating to help out. Uh, something like this, which is helping the Indian ecosystem for helping people coming back because we see a lot of intermediate uh, researchers coming back and apply for applying for these fellowships. And uh, yeah, it's a mixed back feeling. Sometimes you want to go back to the bench work. Sometimes you are set here because you love love the work, work environment and everything here. Uh, per case that you have a kind of a nine to five job. Uh, so sometimes when you're exhausted with the uh, lab life, sometimes this gives you a little bit of solace. So yeah, I do answer your question. Yes, I do this my bench work at times. Now, last question for today's conversation: If you can give some suggestion to the researchers who are in 
you know, in mid of thing that when they are thinking that, okay, they want to stay connected to research, but not uh, doing active research on bench. So if you can suggest that how these alternate career of in being into grant, you know, grant management as you are already doing, how uh, practical it is for them to enjoy their research doing on the, you know, on the papers and reviewing all these. So, uh, see, for being a grants advisor in the level that I work or whether you're working for a research management uh, uh, office, in, even in institutes, you know, one of your biggest work is going to be putting grants together, uh, helping a PI in reviewing that grant, not only the budget part, probably onto, also in the scientific way, helping the PI to network and get collaborators. So the scientist in you has to be there. Because until as I said, like uh, you give me an uh, eye optics uh, project with a AI and it takes me two days just to understand the entire concept. But I think I understood because scientists in me was very curious to understand. Okay. So yes, it is, it, it is okay. It, it is a good, good option if you are really looking to shift to a no, much more non-academia role. And uh, it, it's, it's always... I think it's always very flexible to keep your mind open because you never know whether you're in this role because I have known some people who are brilliant researchers and they decided to someday hand their boots and come into being research managers and they are doing fa fabulous in this space because you do read research managers and in India we did not have this research management thing till now I think eight eight years back also but now institutes are, lo are looking into it and honestly sometimes uh it is okay because this also provides you with a lot of insights. You still get to go to conferences because research managers also get to go to conferences, present paper, do research. I mean, I, I have colleagues who have done uh, data research as to how research management has improved the quality of research in India or whether it has not. So scientists never goes away. You can keep on doing your science at the sly and do your research manager jobs job as well. But yes, I, I think this is a fabulous career, alternative career, if you're looking for after you want to hang your boots on the bench work. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Ritri, for this conversation. And I would like now to say to all the viewers that if you want more insights from Dr. Ritri, you can write to her directly. If you want Empowering Science Foundation to put you in touch with our researcher celebrities, please feel free to write to us and enjoy the passion of research and we here celebrate your research on this platform of research as celebrity with this thank you very much dr ritri for sharing the journey and motivating so many younger researchers thank you thanks a lot it was lovely to be here